Okay, folks, it is in, in my part of the country, it is 45, so it's time to get started. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Margo Malachowski, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm an education and outreach coordinator for the network of the National Library of Medicine. Welcome to Blossom, building lifelong opportunities for strength, self-care, outlook, morale, and mindfulness. I have a few housekeeping items before we begin with Rock's Roll Downhill with our speaker, Amy Turin. So let me advance my slides here. We do have a hashtag for this event. It's hashtag Blossom 2021. Whoops. Okay, so if you would like to chat with your fellow attendees, please use the chat tab on the right in the conversations panel. If you have a question for our presenter, please submit that in the Q&A tab. Now, we do have a lot of people on today's event. I will do my best to feed, her, uh, to feed our presenter questions at the end. This session is closed captioned. To access the closed captioning, please go to nnlm.gov slash blossomcc. Now, uh, just a reminder that by attending any of the sessions in Blossom, you have agreed to uh, the code of conduct. I know we're all professionals here, and we do appreciate your cooperation. Before we get into our session, uh, I just want to go over our acronyms again. Uh, the NIH or is the National Institutes of Health the nation's leading medical research agency. My, right now, many people are familiar with the National Centers for uh, Allergies and Infectious Diseases, where Dr. Fauci is the director. But this is just one of many institutes and centers at the NIH. The National Library of Medicine is an institute at the NIH, and it's the world's largest biomedical library which produces electronic information resources such as Medline Plus and PubMed. NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine, and we are the outreach program. And the RMLs, or regional medical libraries, are where the programs are created and, and shared throughout the region, and we do collaborate to offer programs nationally. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my presentation and Amy invite you to share yours. All right, hopefully everyone can see the slides. Yep, looks Great. good. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello and thank you all of you for attending my presentation today. My name is Amy Turin and my pronouns are she, her, hers. To help ensure that I will not end up distracting myself and to reduce the risk of accidental cattail appearance, I will be conducting the majority of my presentation with my camera off. I will turn it back on for the Q&A portion of the session, at which you may very well see a black cattail going back and forth and back and forth like I'm running some kind of one-woman feline fashion show here in my own home. That tail, should it appear, belongs to Macduff. He also says hello. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. I understand that there's over 5,000 individuals who have registered for this conference, and no doubt we all currently reside as either settlers or indigenous people ourselves in the traditional territories of any number of First Peoples. I myself am presenting from the traditional and unceded territory of the Nuwu people, also known as the Southern Paiute people, and I am a settler on lands that historically used and stewarded by the past ancestors, as well as the current members of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge both the historical and contemporary harms caused by white supremacy that have led and continue to lead to forced relocation, murder, impoverishment, and theft of language, culture, and traditions of so many indigenous people around the world. I encourage everyone to consider taking action, such as making a donation to a land recovery effort. 
I've included the names of some websites of three land recovery organizations for your consideration. These include the Land Back Project, the Indian, spelled N-D-N, Collective, which is the official sponsor of the Land Back Project, and the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Thank you. Before I dive into the meat of my presentation, I want to take a few minutes to talk about what led me to think about and re research these issues. In 2012, following a career change, I moved from my home in the state of California and moved to the state of Georgia, hence the peaches. I made this move to start my first library faculty position at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. At the time of my move, I had only been to Georgia and indeed the South at all for the interview a few months before. I was very much a newcomer to the state as well as to the region, which is broadly, of course, known as the Deep South of the Bible Belt. I had moved about three days before starting my job, and I was still adapting to being mammed and having phone conversations and with God bless. Note, never enter phone conversation with bless your heart. That is an entirely separate meaning. At my first one-on-one -on -one with my new boss, the excellent and incomparable Theresa Rhodes, I was given some amazing advice. Except that because it was my first day and my first job in a new profession, and because I was still adapting to the time change and the culture, and probably because honestly at 30, I knew everything there was to need to know, I entirely missed her point. Theresa started the meeting by sharing her onboarding materials. It was a mid-sized binder filled with all kinds of documentation, policies, standardized forms, contact lists, job duty expectations, the things you would expect to see. The folder also included a document about Theresa herself, which told me the name of her husband and her cats, told me her preferred working hours, her out of work email policy, and had a note that the reference desk ever got a call from a lady who wanted to talk to Theresa. It was probably either her sister or her mother, and they were trying to get a hold of her because she'd muted or lost her cell phone. Anyone receiving such a call was to just tell her sister or her mom that we'd pass on the message and then go find her, Theresa, out in the stacks. This document would also prove to be important in the future, but again, I was new and bewildered and pretty sure that I was now a professional woman, all caps, so I didn't register the importance of it at the moment. Anyways, at the end of our meeting, after we'd gone through the binder in detail, Theresa did something remarkable. Although, remember, I didn't recognize it as being remarkable at the time. My new boss looked me dead in the eye and said, I want you to promise me three things. Okay, I said. I mean, this was my new boss, right? I was going to do whatever she asked me to do. I want you to promise me that you will find friends who don't work in the library and don't work at Mercer. Um, okay, I said, thinking this was strange, but whatever. Making friends seemed easy enough, although placing limitations on their place of employment seemed like a strange criteria to me. I want you to promise me that you will make time to be physically active. Sure, I said. I thought this was a bit presumptuous, honestly, but Theresa had already told me that she arrived on campus very early in the morning. We're talking like 4 a.m. And then she took a break from her work to go to the gym around 7 a.m. I figured this was just sporty advice from a sporty lady. I want you to promise me that you will find a spiritual outlet. It can be a church or a temple or just walking outside. I don't care what it is and I will not ask you again, but I want you to find something. Ah, I thought, this is that whole Bible Belt thing. I'd been told, mostly accurately as it turned out, that people in Macon's first question when meeting someone new was, what's your name? And their second question was, what church do you belong to? This would be one more story to tell my friends back home in California about the South. I chuckled to myself as I agreed to this last condition. And then I shook Theresa's hand and I walked out of the office. And honestly, I didn't think about those three promises again until five years later, when I moved to my new supervisory position 2,000 miles away. It was only then, five years later, that I realized what remarkable advice Theresa had offered me on that day. What I had mistaken as hokey down-home suggestions was actually an incredible gift. I was told by my boss on my first day as part of a discussion regarding expectations for my tenure as an employee that part of working for Theresa meant not only doing my job, but also caring for myself socially, physically, and spiritually. I was being invited, no, I was being instructed to care for my whole self. This is remarkable advice to receive both in terms of what these promises said about Theresa's values and expectations for her employees, as well as being just genuinely solid advice. 
It's hard to function well if you don't care for the many aspects of yourself. Poor treatments of oneself causes harm to oneself. And if that person is also responsible for leading others, it can cause knock-on harm to still more people. Leadership is always something of a cascade scenario. What leaders enforce, enable, and model will, generally speaking, filter down and replicate. It is up to leaders to be mindful about what kind of cascade they are generating, one that promotes wellness or one that causes ongoing patterns of harm. So let's talk about why workplace wellness matters. This section is of importance to everyone, no matter what their role in libraries. A note, my statistics in this section reflect the American work experience and survey results, but the themes are nonetheless applicable to workers outside the United States context as well. Stress has both physiological and psychological side effects. These effects are both short-term and long-term. Short-term psychological effects can include anxiety, narrowing of focus, inability to focus, and the activation of the fight or flight response. Similarly, stress has a number of short-term physical effects, including headaches, shaking, or other expressions of nervous energy, upset stomach, and sleep disorders. When stress continues over a long period, perhaps even reaching a burnout stage, more significant physical and psychological side of effects can occur. Both the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic identify a whole suite of physical complaints associated with prolonged stress. They include, but are not limited to, headache, muscle pain, chest pain, depression, anxiety, changes in sex drive, gastrointestinal distress, sleep disturbances, grinding related tooth damage, weight loss, weight gain, hyperhidrosis, tachycardia, and others. In fact, a 2014 study from the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine reported that between 60 and 90% of visits to the doctor are prompted by a stress-related complaint. Effectively, we are worrying ourselves into conditions and illnesses that we might not otherwise have experienced if our health was not challenged and degraded by ongoing stress and anxiety. Unfortunately, stress in the workplace is only getting worse. A series of surveys conducted by the American Psychological Association shows a distinct upward trend in U.S.-based employee stress. As you can see on the slide here, in 2017, 33% of respondents reported feeling extreme stress, while 48% of that same pool reported feeling that their overall stress levels had increased since 2009, five years before. In 2017, 61% of respondents reported feeling exhausted, while 85% of the same pool reported being run down and drained. And in 2019, despite ongoing high levels of reported stress, whopping 90% of respondents said they also felt behind at work. This suggests that in addition to the negative emotional impacts generally associated with stress, at least some respondents were also beginning to experience sensations of guilt associated with the perceived lack of progress or industry, which might have further exacerbated poor mental and emotional health conditions. And then of course, we came to 2020 and the emergence of the novel coronavirus. The psychological impact of both coronavirus and the steps made necessary to reduce its spread have led to a sharp rise in overall stress. This stress has many manifestations and causes, including ongoing uncertainty, fear of exposure, and side effects from extended isolation, among others. Library workers have, been ex have experienced a vast variety of workplace responses to COVID-19, with some required by their employers to stay on site and risk exposure. Others have been working from home for more than a year and have faced an increasing lack of division between their work life and their personal life. And because we are still very much in the pandemic, and I want to emphasize that, we are still in the pandemic. We do not yet know what the ultimate psychological, physiological, and emotional toll of COVID-19 will be. Given early in studies, studies and reports, however, it's likely to be very significant. So why, some may ask, should organizations and employers care about workplace wellness? My gut response is, of course, that they should care because it's a decent and moral thing to do. But those who need reasons more compelling to a capitalist cause, there is a simple fact. High or ongoing stress leads to illness. Illness leads to a decent efficiency, potential absenteeism, and higher than normal turnover. It is more efficient for organizations to care about their employees and to provide preventative health measures than to try and cope with navigating ongoing absences. Consider our stacked rock image here. It's beautiful and balanced, right? But what happens if I remove, say, 
the second rock from the bottom or the third from the top. If your workplace is struggling to see their role in supporting the wellness of workers, encourage them to see this work as part of their efforts to ensure consistency and efficiency. It may be frustrating to have to take this approach. I totally get your frustration and rage with that. But for organizations deeply entrenched in the capitalist mindset, it may be more effective than appealing to common decency. The good news is, is that many of us, hopefully most of us, probably work at an organization that are at least aware to some degree of their role in helping maintain the wellness for those who work for them. Common programs include wellness rewards programs, preventative health programming with third party vendors, low cost gyms. I will say these are usually on campus gyms, at least for academic organizations, but some organizations will pay for a portion of an annual gym membership off campus. They just don't necessarily always advertise that. Of course, employee assistance programs are another common program. These are usually called EAPs and they provide a number of counseling services. Less common are various iterations of the spiritual health leave program. Usually this provides employees with an hour a week to attend a religious service or a religious organization of their choice during work hours while in paid status, but may or may not include travel time. Flex scheduling is an increasingly common practice as well, allowing employees to set atypical work schedules to meet their personal preferences, their health needs, or caretaking needs. With COVID and the resulting increase in employees working from home, it is likely we will see a similar expansion of work from home benefits in the near future. While everyone needs to be aware of the services available at their place of employment, it is particularly critical for supervisors to be up to, up to date on all available options. Quite often it's the supervisor, not HR, that employees will come to with a problem. We are obligated as supervisors to fully understand what pre-existing services are available for immediate use should our employees need them. Similarly, I believe supervisors are also obligated to advocate for the expansion of existing services. So supervisors who are in this call, if there uh, are organizational level wellness services that I listed that your institution doesn't have, I strongly encourage that you advocate for their, their implementation. You can reach out to me and we can talk about ways that um, we might be able to do, help each other do that. Comic book fans with it, Ben Parker, the uncle of the web-slinging superhero Spider-Man, once admonished his nephew with the off-quoted line, with great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben was right. Although his wisdom applies not only to superheroes, it also applies to supervisors. Within organizations, there are a number of types of power structures that enable an individual's authority and control. Depending on the resources you read, these powers are either number six, seven, or more recently, eight. Seven, however, has been the number most commonly used, one that I'll be using in this presentation to describe the contemporary library workplace power structure. The most commonly cited seven powers include legitimate power, and this is the power granted by organizational position, which gives an individual control over another person. Essentially, this is the power that's given to you by virtue of your position on an org chart relative to someone else. Coercive power, the power to coerce or punish, essentially. Expert power, this is the power that is derived by both your skills and experience and the respect of have for those traits. That respect part is particularly important, by the way. Informational power. Informational power is a short-term power based on basically you know something that other people don't. And of course, this power dissipates as soon as you share that information. This is not a call for information, by the way, just defining what, what informational power is. And the power of reward, just like it says on the tin, the power of reward is the ability to reward others for actions that please you. Connection power. Connection power is derived from the ability to establish and maintain beneficial personal relationships. And finally, uh, referent, which I just realized I typed as reference, my apologies, it should be referent power, the power granted by others who admire or acknowledge the individual as a leader. Supervisors, by virtue of their positions in an org chart, sit at the intersection of many of these power models. Supervisors have an obligation to use the powers at their disposal carefully and in full awareness that their decisions to use certain types of power will have both immediate and long-term effects on both culture and individuals. 
I want to draw special attention to my claim that supervisors leveraging their power impacts organizational culture and not just individuals, particularly in the context of wellness. Even, super, even supervisors who do not intentionally engage in establishing and maintaining organizational norms in the areas of wellness will exert impact. Employees will naturally interpret the culture and the expectations based on either the action to those in supervisory capacities to the choices made. Um, sorry, I just lost myself in my own sentence. Let me start that again. Employees will naturally interpret the culture and expectations based on either of the reaction of those in supervisor capacities to the choices made by those whom their organizational powers allows them to reward or punish, or by the behavior and choices modeled by those in a supervisory capacity themselves. And yes, I 100% did just quote myself from a previous publication, both on the slide and in the speech, and it turns out I am exactly that kind of person. Here's some very quick examples. Have you ever seen a colleague be shouted out of an office for asking for vacation time during a particularly pressing deadline? You no doubt remember that later, and you made your future leave requests with a little more strategy. Similarly, if an employee repeatedly observes management approving early dismissal for employees to see their children participate in after school events, then that employee probably will feel confident enough to assure their child that they will be in attendance for the school talent show before formally request time off. Supervisors, our actions are being observed and interpreted constantly, and we must, as a result, strive to make intentional choices that benefit the well being of everyone. I want to return briefly to Georgia. I mentioned earlier that my old boss, Theresa, had provided a sheet of personal information in her orientation binder. There were a few other factoids on it that I did not fully appreciate when I first read them. According to Theresa's feet, she elected not to have lunch in the lunchroom with others so that she could instead eat alone and relax or maybe catch a brief nap. We were asked to please respect this lunchtime ritual, unless it was an emergency, of course. And similarly, Theresa noted that she would indicate when she was having quiet time with a soccer closed door. This was time for her to think and focus, unless, again, there was an emergency of some kind. At the time, my only response to these preferences was to wish that my office was also big enough to fit a lazy boy in it like Theresa's was. But over time, I began to notice that other people, particularly people in departments overseen by Theresa, mimic some of her habits. Most people had some iteration of a quiet time sign, and one or two took comfort in knowing that it wasn't a sackable offense to catch a nap during lunch instead of eating quickly and moving on to the next task. In setting norms for her own health and wellness, Theresa quietly but surely gave permission for others to do the same in order to meet their own needs. Leaders, it isn't always necessary to announce new policies, pronounce new edicts, or hold multi-day meetings to discuss norms and values when it comes to wellness. Sometimes quiet, honest, and considerate modeling does an even better job. So what happens if you don't prioritize your own wellness? Is my old boss? Well, that's when you start to see fallout, and rarely does that fallout exclusively impact yourself. Fallout tends to, well, it tends to fall, which means it's more likely to strike those below you than above. There's even a name for this, which I love, and that's called the salt management paradigm. Virtually everyone has been subject to the seagull management paradigm. Hopefully far fewer have been the cause of it. The term started as a joke in the 1985 edition of Ken Blanchard's book, The One Minute Manager, but over time it has come to serve as an archetype for a specific kind of novice manager. The reality is, however, that all managers, no matter how experienced we may be, we're all at risk of having a seagull moment. The remainder of, of my presentation will focus on how to avoid embracing your inner seagull and save you from having to, um, let's just say clean up. Understand that moods and emotions spread. Extra to another person's mood, particularly a strong one, can result in sympathetic mimicry. Counter this by being mindful of your emotions and their sources. Awareness of why one is feeling a particular way can help reduce the intensity of the experience. This is particularly important for low-ranking middlemans who have limited control over the priorities of those above them in the hierarchy, but who also have to ensure that these priorities are adopted, sometimes very quickly, by frontline workers that they oversee. Middle managers must be vigilant then to interrupt the unnecessary spread of negative emotions from above. Imagine, for example, a middle manager who is informed by their very anxious supervisor about a very sudden change in priorities. 
the manager supervisor, who no doubt is reacting to their supervisor's anxiety, who may, may well be reacting to their supervisor's anxiety, is of doom and gloom. By the end of the meeting, the middle manager, who had previously not been feeling any sort of strong emotion, is now feeling fraught and overwhelmed. Rather than proceeding directly to reporting the latest catastrophe to their employees and the spreading despair, managers should instead pause and be mindful. Why are they upset? Is the situation worthy of this level of distress? Is it possible to separate the facts from the emotion? And how can this information be shared in a way that allows employees to have their own genuine organic reactions rather than prime the proverbial pump with borrowed emotions? I do want to note that this is not necessarily saying that everything has to be great all the time. I'm simply asking that folks consider what emotions they attach to information as they share it through an organization. Personally, I have a theory that all people have their own internal drama threshold. This is a highly individual level at which one can manage drama or stress before becoming overwhelmed. Because these thresholds are so individualized, you may occasionally find yourself working with someone whose drama threshold is incompatible with yours. If you can't avoid this person, and in a work situation, chances are you're not going to be able to, give yourself permission to be strategic about where you meet and when you meet with them. If you're a brooder, for example, don't schedule meetings with people who force you outside of your drama threshold on a Friday afternoon. Give yourself permission to refuse to have your weekend snatched by stress and worry. If you tend to absorb other people's stress, and shout out to my empaths in the I know you're there, bookend time around these meetings so that you can both prep yourself and decompress before you have to work with other people. This will allow you to meet both your own needs and ensure your frustrations aren't being passed along to others. And I also want to remind folks, particularly leaders, that you are not responsible for fixing everything. This is something that I struggle with in my own practice. I want to be helpful, and honestly, I really value my own ability to react quickly and find innovative solutions. But sometimes I run the risk of taking on problems, or even stress that isn't mine to solve or carry. Another former supervisor of mine, Pat Hawthorne, was fond of the idiom, not my monkey, not my circus. Essentially, this saying, which supposedly is Polish in origin, is a reminder to not take on problems we are not actually responsible for. For those of us who are helpers, we need to be careful that we aren't taking on the problems of others, even just emotionally, and expending our energy and reserves that can be better used ensuring others don't suffer from our own inevitable fallout. And of course, the workplace isn't the only place where one's personal rocks might fall. Returning home exhausted, only to careen directly into the needs and demands of others, can result in similar and just as damaging rock slides as well. If finding that you, you unload the moment you arrive at home and that this approach of processing is harming your relationship with others, it might be time to reconsider how you separate your work life from your home life. For myself, I find that I need a bit of time after work to decompress. Generally, it's about 30 minutes, maybe 60. Other folks know I know set a timer limiting how long they can complain about work when they talk to their partners, with their children, or their pets. And yes, you people do talk to their pets, and the things that McDuff knows, y'all, you would not believe. Others swear by the stress-reducing effects of exercise, crafting, zoning out in front of the TV, or losing themselves in an engaging book. Whatever your process is, make sure that you have a plan in place and ensure you are able to engage in it regularly, if not daily, to help keep those work rocks at work and not in the home. And it would be remiss of me to not note at this point that the line between work and home has become increasingly porous since the outbreak of the coronavirus. For example, I am coming to you right now from my office, which used to be known as my guest bedroom way back in 2019. Because there are no real borders between where my workplace ends and where my home begins, I've had to make imaginary borders. I only do my work projects in this room, and I try whenever possible to not do anything else in the room but work, even if it means hauling this entire desktop into the dining room to play World of Warcraft for the Horde, by the way. But even before coronavirus, the borders between work and home have, becoming, have been becoming steadily more permeable for years. Computers and homes, smartphones and pockets, and emails that relay information anywhere at any time have resulted in the workers being perceived as, as accessible 24-7. 
It is therefore up to individual employees to state, stake, and enforce their own boundaries between work and home. These approaches must, be nece must necessarily be unique to that individual, their circumstances, and the requirements of empo their employer organization. Now, I want to share two tips for how to slow the rock fall from my mother. I'd be thrilled that she has a slide. Um, my mom is a now retired K-12 education administrator with over 40 years of work experience. And like the advice my old boss, Theresa, gave me, these are tips that my mother has given me for years and which I have steadily ignored until recently. Sorry, mom. As I mentioned before, one of my personal challenges is to remember to not take on the problems that aren't mine and not move too fast. These tips are likely to be of particular use for those who deal with similar impulses. The tip is perhaps the most important lesson I've ever, well, I wouldn't say I've learned it because I feel like I'm constantly learning and relearning it. But to be honest, I think most of us are. This is the life-changing magic of silence. Sometimes, many times it turns out, silence is an ideal response. Now, I'm not advocating for responding to all situations with stony silence or refusing to give input. What I'm advocating for is to give people space to resolve their own issues without charging in and providing them with a solution they never actually asked for that they never ask for part really key. As leaders and supervisors, we are often charged with resolving problems, which means we tend to get in a bit of a role and we assume that advice is always being asked for even when it isn't. And of course, advice from a boss often sounds a lot less like advice and more like instructions. Clarify what is needed, be it advice, empathy, or just awareness. And I mean genuinely clarify, ask, are you asking for advice? Are you asking for, Empathy, are you just wanting to keep me updated? This will save you and your employees quite a lot of stress and bother. It'll also help you as a supervisor retain energy and motivation for the things that really matter. The second tip from mom is for those moments when you just cannot take it anymore. You are done. Pick up a folder with a few papers in it and walk away across campus, to another building, whatever it takes. No one, as my mother notes, questions or stops someone who is striding purposely away with a file folder in hand. It looks like you are off to a very important meeting after all. Walking will help you expend frustrated energy, and new scenery gives you something else to focus on. You can choose to be mindful as you walk, say focusing on the heat of the sun or the number of people walking dogs on campus. If walking isn't an option, take your folder to an unused room and shut that door. No one thinks twice about sitting in an empty office examining papers in a file folder. The trick here is to get away from the situation so you have space and time to reset before your rocks fall. A few times during the course of this presentation, I have referenced mindfulness. I want to quickly clarify what I personally mean by mindfulness and how I use it in the workplace to support my own well-being. My favorite definition of mindfulness comes from John Kabat-Zinn. He's a prolific author and scholar in the field of mindfulness and mind-body medicine. Kabat-Zinn defines mindfulness as the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. Another mindfulness devotee, Scott Eblen, deconstructs Kabat-Zinn's definition helpfully. He says, awareness is another word for noticing what's going on. Paying attention on purpose suggests that we can make a choice to be aware and notice. In the present moment means focusing on what's happening right now, not ruminating on what's already happened or worrying about what might happen. Non-judgmentally means we don't waste mental or emotional energy labeling events or thoughts as good as bad. We just acknowledge what we're seeing, thinking, or feeling. Mindfulness can help us identify and understand when our rocks are shifting. This awareness in turn can slow or entirely stop the impending fall. There are a few things you need to keep in mind about mindfulness. Human beings are wired to react to stimuli. Mindfulness asks us not to simply react, but to observe our desire to react and then move forward in a more thoughtful manner. Our culture is steeped in capitalist rhetoric that encourages us to seek constant pleasure and avoid discomfort through the sedative of glut gluttonous acquisition. And this works in direct contrast to the goals of mindfulness. This means that our commitment to mindfulness is continually challenged both by our cultural norms and our cultural artifacts that surround us. And these things encourage us to instead embrace reaction over non-judgmental awareness. This in turn makes mindfulness hard, that's okay expect it to be hard. 
Understand that mindfulness is a practice and practices require ongoing effort. You will never reach the point where you have achieved mindfulness on a permanent basis. Don't make that the end goal. Just focus the practice in the moment. Much like my mother's emergency file folder plan, mindfulness includes a number of techniques that can be used to interrupt threatening rock falls. Most fall under this broad umbrella of meditation. Uh, these meditations can be silent or guided, and they can focus on nothingness on a specific sense or senses, or they can use visual imagery to shift the practitioner out of a reactive mindset and into a more mindful one. Breathing exercises commonly associated with mindfulness and meditation include both box breathing, which is used by the armed forces, and seven, four, four, seven, eight breathing, which is a favorite of biofeedback practitioners. In box breathing, individuals inhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, and again for four seconds repeatedly. Four, seven, eight breathing, on the other hand, uses that four beat inhale, followed by a seven beat hold and an eight beat exhale. Both breathing practices require multiple repetitions to have a full effect. Body skeditations can also be completed in the office, and they're another good way to slow down before the rocks fall. They can complete it in silence or with an audio narration. And honestly, if you do a quick Google, you will find many, many, many free narratives for body scans. Body scans involve focusing the attention on different parts of the body, compressing down from the crown of the head or rising up from the toes. Careful, focused attention on breathing into or otherwise relaxing each individual body part slows both, <clears throat> both race hearts and minds and focuses the attention on the moment. There's another common technique and one that actually lends itself well to an online Zoom panel, which is the five senses exercise. I'm gonna ask you all to join me in this exercise now so that you can use it in the future should you do. First, Notice five things that you can see. Look around you and become aware of your environment. Try to pick out something that you don't usually notice. Right now, in this moment, some of the things that I'm seeing include the bumpy texture of a blue vase that makes it seem like it's made of waves. And I'm also observing the way the shadows cast patterns on the roof tiles of the apartment building across from mine. Second. Notice four things that you can feel. Bring attention to the things that you're currently feeling, such as the texture of your clothing or the smooth surface of the table that you're resting your hands on. Third, notice three things that you can hear. Listen for and notice things in the background that you might not normally notice. It could be birds chirping outside or maybe an appliance humming in the next room. Or, if you're like me, it might just be the sound of your cat snoring. Fourth, notice two things that you can smell. Bring attention to scents that you usually filter out, either pleasant or unpleasant. Catch a whisk of the husk is blooming outside or food cooking in the kitchen. And finally, notice one thing that you can taste. Take a sip of your drink, chew gum, or just notice the current taste in your mouth and focus on that. Thank you for indulging me in slowing down and focusing on this moment. I hope that this little mindfulness break has helped center you. I know it certainly helped me. If you're interested in learning more about mindfulness, I'd also like to recommend a few additional tools. I've identified a number of popular apps for mindfulness, although you'll find many more of these if you look at your app store or Google Play Store. The Shine app I'm featuring because it's women-owned, it features female-focused meditations. Liberate is a Black-owned, Black-focused meditation app explicitly committed to creating safe spaces for the Black community to engage in daily meditation. Headspace is probably one of the better known apps and it does not have any particular focus other than meditation, but I'm featuring it because an increasing number of employers and alumni associations offer free or discounted annual subscriptions to their platforms. I also, of course, want to up the amazing work of the folks at Mindful and Lists, which is a web page, a Twitter presence, and a robust resource guide. Its founder, Amanda Leftwich, will guide tomorrow morning's opening welcome and guided practice session, and I really hope that you'll join me in attending that. 
Other mindfulness resources I've recommended include the San Francisco Dharma Collective, which offers a wide variety of meditative programming with special emphasis on facilitating sessions that support the emotional and community needs of marginalized people. Their programming is largely online due to the ongoing pandemic, and it features a sliding payment scale, including no-cost options for those who are just unable to pay right now. They offer both daily meditation practices and practices themed around current political events and social justice movements. Finally, I'm recommending John Kabat-Zinn's classic text, text Full C Catastrophe Living. In addition to breaking down the benefits of meditation in a more nuanced way than I have time for in this presentation, the text includes step-by-step -step guides to establishing your own mindfulness practice. Mindfulness is only one part of self-care, though. And if you remember back to the beginning of the lecture, I noted that my old boss asked three things from me, three practices that would sustain my social, physical, and spiritual or emotional self. We must all engage in self-care for our own longevity. Supervisors must engage in self-care not only for their own self, but for the sake of those who rely on them. And yet it can sometimes be very challenging to prioritize one's own self-care. You will no doubt hear throughout this conference that self-care is not and will never be selfish. Self-care enables you to help yourself and others. You could even argue that self-care is a part of the social contract that allows us to live and work in community with others. You must care for yourself as well as be gentle with yourself. Do not expect more from yourself than you would from others. You are not a superhero and they do not give out rosettes for self-denial and overwork. Remember, too, to care for the many aspects of yourself. All your parts need to be tended to. If needed, make use of wellness planning worksheets. A Google search will show you many examples, although you can probably just make your own as well. The one on screen right now is available for free from the Audrey Lord Project, and the quote is from their website. Most wellness sheets identify either three or four key categories, mind, body, spirit, or heart, and as you can see in this type of form, community. Find the areas that matter most to you and make weekly commitments to yourself to meet the needs that you have in these subcategories. This is another example of a sample wellness sheet available online from Microdesigns. What I like about this one is it includes both the section on joy killers to avoid, because sometimes I need that reminder, and a space to reflect on the past week. This kind of chart can easily be maintained in a diary or in a bullet journal, even just on a note app on your phone. Other resources in the area of wellness that I would like to recommend for those interested in learning more include the hugely popular Coursera course from Yale's Dr. Lori Santos and the science called The Science of Wellbeing. This course is free, it's online, and it provides lots of practical tips to cultivate wellness, um, as well as does some pretty deep dives into the literature of both wellness and happiness studies. I also recommend Scott Eblen's book, Overworked and Overwhelmed, The Mindfulness Alternative, which includes some very useful uh, wellness within the books itself. Um, and it also specifies and prioritizes managing mindfulness priorities while in the workplace. And finally, I strongly recommend folks consider either joining or establishing a cohort of supporters. I've facilitated an international cohort of library middle managers for two years now. We meet once a month online and we check in with each other. We provide workplace situation feedback and just support for one another when our personal or professional situations get tough. I want to thank everyone for listening so patiently to me today, as well as for signing up to participate in all the other wonderful upcoming events that are part of Blossom. But before we move on to the Q&A, I want to ask each of you to do three things for me and for yourselves. And for Theresa Rhodes, whose advice I really should have taken all those years ago. Promise me and promise yourselves that going forward, you will find people to socialize with who work outside of your organization that you will be, take time to become physically active in some way, and that you will find a spiritual outlet that is meaningful and fulfilling to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Amy. Sure thing. Um, so we have a few questions, and I'll keep an eye on the Q&A in case any more come in. Um, so the, a number of people were curious to know if you followed the advice of your former boss. 
I eventually did. Yes. Um, I did not initially at my own peril. <laughs> and then I ultimately um, did it, it, uh, realize how important that was. You know, it was interesting. As a, I, I came to the library edition from being a traditional academic, and then I work in academic libraries. And as a result, we tend to focus, or at least I tend to focus a lot on your intellectual output. And you become very much a mind that happens to be in a body. And what I realize, and a soul that happens to be in a body. What I really realize is those other things need cultivation and attention as well. And I, I regret for my past self that I didn't focus on that earlier. Okay. Um, and uh, and there was one comment, and I think it was probably uh, to do with uh, developing a health and humane workplaces, who was responsible for creating job descriptions. And I think that's probably part of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Do you have so any thoughts on that? In my organization, job descriptions are developed by the supervisor. Um, initial job description that goes out as far as like an advertisement. After that, they should be negotiable between the employer and the employee at all times. There's an annual year, a point of the year, every year, at least at my organization, where you sign that. That's your time to say, this is not working for me. I need to specify that these are the things that I'm going to be doing. Okay. <laughs> Um, then, uh, you know, there are a couple of questions about how would a supervisor help an employee who is struggling mentally? Um, I, I imagine that's always an issue, but particularly now. Um, so the first thing you need to do is listen. And I emphasize listen first so that you're available, but also that, so that you are not inserting yourself and deciding what that person needs. Um, and you need to have the question, what can I do to help you? What do you need at this point? Um, and sometimes that conversation might have to happen over several sessions because there might be some things that an employee needs that you can't necessarily get to right away. You know, you need to find mm -hmm. out what the policies are. But have those conversations in good faith. Um, to kind of refer back to my my old boss, Theresa, you knew she was going to take taking something seriously if she said, "I need to pray on." Uh, now, it's not a phrase that I use in, in my workplace just because it doesn't reflect my personal life, but mm -hmm. I knew that she was taking that seriously and I knew she was going to find information. Be the person that your employees know will take seriously, take their concerns seriously and will find out all the options available to them. Well, it's interesting you just said that because there's been a couple of observations about discussing religion in the workplace or how do we make space for, you know, you talked about a spiritual practice, mm -hmm. um, but that in some workplaces could be a fine line. Um, it can be. I mean, the institution I'm working at now is my first uh, public institution, uh, despite being absolutely the worst Catholic who got kicked out of CCD every week as a kid. I mm -hmm. worked primarily in religious uh, universities until now. Um, so that was that was part of the culture. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if your culture is not accepting of it, there should be a discussion about why and and what are the norms like. You know, most institutions have a prayer room now for students. Why is that not accessible staff? Or is it accessible staff? It might just be that people didn't talk about it. And there is a difference between sharing your your spiritual beliefs on the level of values than trying to recruit people to it. I would also emphasize that. Okay, it almost um, links back to the uh, the employee who's struggling. Um, it, it, how do you not get kind of sucked into that? How do you know they're into the drama, you know, especially if you're a giving person. You have to find practices that work for you. And I wish there was one answer that I could just say, do this and everything will be super forever. Um, that's not the case. For myself, I can describe my own practice. I do, I respond very strongly to visual meditation. I do a visual meditation at the end of every day where I imagine myself walking on a, on a safe space by a body of water. Um, and what that space might look for you or someone else would be very different. Uh, and I imagine that I come to the shore and there are two stacks of stones and there's of um, black stones and white stones, and they can be any colors. This is just the way I was taught. And on black stones, you pick them up and you write down all the things from your day that you don't want in your life right now, that, you, that stress. Um, even if it's uh, you know empathy for others, but it's harming you and you visualize throwing that into the water and then you use the white stones to replace that hole with something else. Um, and I understand that sounds very woo woo, but it works for me and I hope all of you find something that works for you. Um, 
I don't know if that ha helps you. Yeah, and that, that also might be a practice. Somebody has mentioned they have a, dra uh, a drama uh, boss. Yes. <laughs> And how to set the boundary to stop the negativity from, from higher up. I mean, we've been talking about being advisors, but also yeah. if you're in a middle position. It is extremely challenging. I've had this happen. I found that ultimately I needed to, to have about 20 minutes before that I kind of geed myself up and I was like, I will not take this other person's drama on. Amy, this is, this is your line. This is your boundary, all that self-talk. And then I needed to have space after that to um, not have to talk to other people. And then to get it out of me, I needed to, initially I, I did that by, by calling my poor mother, just word vomiting on her. And that was not good for her health in the long run. So instead what I started doing was I write up everything that's frustrating from that meeting on a piece of paper. And then I either shred it or you know I might take it home and burn it. I, I suggest you don't throw it away in the off, the only thing I would say. Right. <laughs> You know, and, and I, I love that image of your mother walking or walking away with the folder because I think sometimes um, movement, you know, like uh, rather rather than just being, you know, in your head about it, sometimes uh, just like physically doing something helps kind of um, work off some of that yeah. um, energy. <laughs> yeah. I do want to call attention to April's comment. I strongly agree with your, she suggests that we don't use black and white for good and bad experience. I agree. Um, I apologize for that framing. It was the way that I was taught it, but I should have framed it differently in sharing with this group. My apologies, okay. April, and to everyone else. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, what about when you're hearing that you're supposed to respond to emails after work or, or because if a staff a person needs you, how do you draw the line there? So what I do is I... I feel, and you know, every supervisor's, you know, your mileage may vary. I don't feel a supervisor can work nine to five and that's it because of the nature of our jobs because emergencies don't stick to nine to five. So I usually tell my people, look, I will keep an eye on to my email to about nine or 10 and then I probably will not run until the next morning. And what I find is that people at least know that and they're not sending emails out into the void. Mm -hmm. That really makes a difference for people. Mm -hmm. So there is a question about promoting movement or walking during work. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was in a job that I, at, just as I was about to leave the job, they were, the, the city was actually going to allow uh, people to walk during their lunch break and consider it, you know, they would be given an extra hour for lunch if they were walking. Have you heard of any other programs like that? I have heard. I mean, usually they're tied to an app and they track what you're doing. And I find that a little uh, creepy. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, but I would also question a culture where someone needs to know where you are at all times. Um, uh, you know, I understand if you, if you have a desk shift, you're supposed to be at, on the desk shift. But I would resist the urge as a supervisor to constantly monitor where people are. You are a supervisor and a, um, you know, and a leader. And you're supposed to be making things better for people. You are not a low jack system. You do not need to track them. Right. Okay. There's some similar topics coming up. Um, let's see. I, there's a compassion fatigue, which is another thing. I'm, and that's also um, coping with library patrons as well as your staff, I would imagine. Yeah, um, I think compassion fatigue has been, I mean, that's also an issue. It's probably been even more of an issue during COVID-19. But if you work, especially in public services, the stuff that some of our students have to deal with, um, and we, we want to be supportive, we want to hear those things, it can be overwhelming sometimes, which is why you need to care for yourself so that you can take on some of that, but also know what your own personal limits are. And sometimes that limit might be, you know, helping students find the right resource. Right. And that also would tie into somebody else was asking about supporting uh, employees who are coping with mental health uh, issues and, and just having a, a list of resources at your fingertips or, or places yeah. where folks can. I, I maintain a list of all the resources that I know of, both that are offered by the university, but also through the community. I work and live in Las Vegas. It's a very... Um, uh, diverse community, and so there's a lot of community-based resources. Um, 
the uh, uh, Native American Center in town offers uh, specific counseling services for community members. Um, the Jack and Jill uh, community group has resources for um, professional African people, African Americans in professional contexts. There's a gay and lesbian center. What I usually do is rather than I will say, don't look at a person and go, you need this resource. Instead, <laughs> right. I would just provide them with a master list of resources. Right. Uh, yeah. It's a, it keeps a little more um, of that boundary, I guess. Um, yeah. and, and another boundary question is, how do you validate negative feelings of your staff? Like, yeah, I get it. You're right. But, you know, yeah, but not get it into the negativity yourself, I guess. You know, I, I grew up <laughs> I grew up in California in, this, in the 80s and 90s. And so my reaction is, just, you know what? You're right. This sucks. This 100% right. sucks. <laughs> you know, and... Sometimes you have to follow that up. Sometimes you just let that sit there. Let the sucking sit and acknowledge. Like, you don't need to fix it necessarily in some ways. You could then say, what parts of this suck the most? And then we can talk about maybe we can address those. Or these are the, be very honest. These are the things I can't, don't have power over or I can't mm -hmm. control. Given that, what are some things that we can work together uh, to um is something that might make this at least more tolerable. You know, we're not going for a festival of fun at all times, but usually we can make things at least a little more tolerable. Yeah. You know, years ago, I had a therapist say to me, sometimes there isn't a good choice. Yeah. You know, maybe sometimes there, you have to, it's between not so great choices. Yeah. So um, somebody's asking about how to set a new tone. Say you haven't been doing all of this, <laughs> all this time. How do you kind of launch into this? I believe in honesty. I believe saying, look, I'm, I have realized that what I'm doing is not, you know, working. And I would focus it on myself and say, you know, what, the way I've been addressing this has not helped me. So I will be doing this going forward. You could even invite folks to help you in supporting this new effort. The better, people like to help other people. We're in a big old helping profession, right? So mm -hmm. if you say, you know, it would be helpful for me if you, you know, remind me, it depends on what you want, but if you were to say, like, if I start going down, you know, negative train let me know you know or it might simply be just you know help me participate in in this process i mean i i have a very difficult time with unceasing negativity negativity it's just something i struggle with i tell my staff that and i'll say like you will not get my best self if you come in just throw a dead cat on the floor right and go but dead cat Mm -hmm. you will get a better reaction from me if you come in and say, well, it appears we have a dead cat, I would like to resolve it in this way. Um, that being said, they can always cut through the dead cat on the floor, but I just want them to know that they'll get my best self, the mm -hmm. other approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you heard of people uh, have like modeling up, you know, so you were talking about role modeling to your staff. Can you role model up? Is that possible? You can. Um, you basically have to do it by keep taking the high road, which is exhausting, but hopefully it will have a side effect. Occasionally, very select, you can call out behaviors that transgress norms. So, for example, let us say that you are in a culture that, for whatever reason, because there's a lot of legitimate anger and frustration, you've developed, there's a culture that has developed of it being okay to trash people who are in the room. You can call out and say, that. and again, I would put in the eye, and I've had to do this. I have said, like, I would be really embarrassed and horrified if I found out that a group of my colleagues were sitting around together talking about my, talking about me in this way. Just call it out. You don't say anything other than I'm uncomfortable. Most groups, when they find out someone is uncomfortable, will stop because they're making a choice at that point to intentionally make a colleague uncomfortable, and most people will not do that. Mm -hmm. if, and if they do, frankly, leave the room. Get up and walk out of the. That's a that's a big card to play, but you might work at a place where you need to play it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, somebody's asking about staff who are friends with their bosses on Facebook. How do you go, <laughs> to, um, like asking or unfriending them? Um, I would say, go ahead and unfriend. Do not announce it. Just just do it. Um, if your boss says to you. Did you unfriend me on Facebook? The answer is yes. 
Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. and there doesn't need to be judgment with it. And you, again, you could root it in your own needs. Yes, you know, I'm really finding that I need to have a, a more significant break between pers- between my personal life and my work life. And so I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I see Kathleen's comment that it's easier to walk out on Zoom. One of the things I will miss about Zoom is the, oh, no, I have disconnected option. Right. <laughs> You know, that's something my grandson started um, leaving his kindergarten room when he was done. And my daughter was trying to explain to him that that's like walking out of the classroom. Of course, (laughs) he's never even been in a classroom. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. Um, So I think we're winding down. So it is at the hour. So thank you so much, Amy. People were really loving this. Excellent. The next session starts in 30 minutes, and I encourage everybody to get away from your screen a little bit. (laughs) Go get a drink of water, walk around a little bit, and if you come back early, please check out the arena where we have some virtual booths and also the lounge if you're interested in connecting with fellow attendees. So thanks so much. This was great. Bye, folks. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.